My name is Samuel Arimon. I work with the, an organization called TESO, Anti-Corruption Coalition. We are based in Uganda, in a zone, a region called TESO region, a district in Soroti. And um, predominantly our organization is an anti-corruption agency. Uh, but in Uganda, the story of corruption and its connection to the land is quite real. Out of uh, every four land scandals, about three of them will be related to corruption components or pra corrupt practices. And so in our context, there is a real link between how real corruption is in the land sector and uh, basic people's awareness. So our interventions uh, to prevent uh, tackle corruption in the land sector in two fronts. One, at the transactional front, and then two, in dealing with awareness and people's rights and uh, ability to be able to claim what is due to them. In as far as transactions are concerned, we are currently, with the support from GIZ, WILAPU, implementing a program where we are supporting and promoting the government policy on systematic land demarcation. And through that, we target to see that by making land ownership and land transaction as transparent as possible, and information about them available to different stakeholders, the chances of corruption are minimized. We already know that in the formal sector, a lot of reforms have happened, especially with the land that is in the freehold, leasehold, and milo tenure. But the challenge was in regard to land that is within the customary context where formal rules are not very clear. And we began to see the emergence of corruption tendencies, basically self-dealing and the outright uh, corrupt practices by the elites invading the, the customary land tenure aspects as well. So our interventions are actually to promote knowledge by different stakeholders about who owns what uh, aspect, uh, size of land and how is it that their awareness about that can improve the overall knowledge and prevention of corruption practices. So that enables customary land transactions as well to come to the domain of being more transparent, to have orderly regulation, and to be uh, scrutinized by a cross-section of stakeholders. The other aspect is we typically encounter land-related corruption through the aspects of dispute resolution. And the a lot of land cases in Uganda end up at the court, where again many court users will complain about different types of corruption. So through this intervention, we have also been able to promote the use of alternative dispute resolution, basically involving uh, cultural institutions and cultural clans. But more importantly, through this intervention, we have been able to reduce the possibility of corruption, I mean land cases, becoming points of litigation, especially customary land cases. So in that way, again, we reduce the different opportunities where corruption would have invaded a household, been perpetrated against a mother, perpetrated against a widow, an unmarried woman, or other forms of marginalized groups of persons. So again, we see that by intervening around the aspects of preventing corruption in the land sector, we actually secure a number of people. But um, more uh, what needs to be done going forward, um, the definitions around what amounts to corruption in Uganda keeps changing. And now that we have the traditional institutions on board, their definitions around corruption might not be as formalized as those of the state actors. So there is an opportunity really to build on more to do with the social norming, how do cultural leaders understand corruption, what are their interpretations of corruption in the cultural sense, and how can that be leveraged on to actually build more capacity of the traditional institutions in preventing, detecting, and combating corruption.